Chapter 7 The Most High celebrates a new espousal with the Princess of Heaven in order to inaugurate the nuptials of the Incarnation. He adorns her for it. Great are the works of the Most High, for all of them were and are executed with the plentitude of knowledge and goodness ordained in equity and number. None of them is faulty, useless, or ineffectual, superfluous, or vain. All are exquisite and magnificent, finished and executed according to the full measure of his holy will. Such he desired them to be, in order that he might be known and magnified in them. But in comparison to the mystery of the Incarnation, all the works of God add extra, although they are in themselves great, stupendous, and marvellous, more to be admired than comprehended, are only a small spark issuing from the unfathomable abyss of the divinity. This great sacrament of vesting himself in a passable and mortal nature is preeminently the great work of his infinite power and wisdom, and the one which immeasurably excels all the other works and wonders of his powerful arm. For in this mystery, not merely a spark of the divinity, but that whole vast volcano of the infinite Godhead broke forth and communicated itself to men, uniting itself by an indissoluble and eternal union to our terrestrial human nature. If this wonderful sacrament of the king is to be measured only by his own vastness, it follows that the woman in whose womb he was to become man deserved to be so perfectly adorned with the plentitude of his treasures, that no gift or grace within the range of possibility be omitted, and all these gifts be so consummate that nothing is wanting to them. As all this was reasonable and altogether befitting the greatness of the Omnipotent, he certainly fulfilled it in the Most Holy Mary, much better than King Aceris did with the gracious Esther, when he raised her to his magnificent throne. The Most High visited our Queen Mary with such great favors, privileges, and gifts, that the like was never even conceived in the mind of creatures. And when she issued forth in the presence of the courtiers of this great King of the Eternal Ages, they recognized and exalted in her the power of God, at the same time understanding that he who chose to select a woman for his mother knew also how to make her worthy of assuming that position. The seventh day of this mysterious preparation for the approaching sacrament arrived, and in the same hour as already mentioned, the heavenly lady was called and elevated in spirit, but with this difference, that she was bodily raised by her holy angels to the Empyrean heaven, while in her stead one of them remained to represent her in corporeal appearance. Placed into this highest heaven, she saw the divinity by abstract vision as in other days, but always with new and more penetrating light, piercing to new and more profound mysteries, which God, according to his free will, can conceal or reveal. Presently she heard a voice proceeding from the royal throne which said, Our spouse and chosen dove, our gracious friend, who has been found pleasing in our eyes, and has been chosen among thousands, we wish to accept thee anew as our bride, and therefore we wish to adorn and beautify thee in a manner worthy of our design. On hearing these words, the most humble among the humble abased and annihilated herself in the presence of the Most High, more than can be comprehended by human power. Entirely submissive to the divine pleasure, and with entrancing modesty, she responded, At thy feet, O Lord, lies the dust and abject worm. Ready is thy poor slave for the fulfillment of all thy pleasure in her. Make use, O eternal good, of this, thy insignificant instrument, according to thy desire, and dispose of it with thy right hand. 
Presently the Most High commanded two seraphim of those nearest to his throne and highest in dignity to attend on this heavenly virgin. Accompanied by others, they presented themselves in visible form before the throne, and there surrounded the Most Holy Mary, who was more inflamed with divine love than they.